I set it up to feel. There's no question about it. I, I, I think the only thing I have ever measured on this boat is, is the head stay, is, is, the, uh, is the rake measurement, which is where we're gonna start, of course. Um, everything starts with rake. So you see boats come in here all the time and their mainsail is inverted or their mainsail is super deep and people pulling and tweaking on backstays and stuff like that. I'm guaranteeing that, that your rake is wrong. And if your rake, I measure my rake every single week. I measure it multiple times during the week just to get it in my brain. One, one thing I think is pretty advantageous, I'm a big believer in weather forecasts. So I actually, I actually set my boat up for the days racing before I leave my house. So when I come down here and pull it out of the car, I'm 95% sure I'm gonna be set up for that day. So that includes rake, backstay, twist, uh, uh, sheet, sheet tension, all the little, all the little stuff. You know, uh, Jamie and I, J the, the gimp over here, Jamie and I, I've been driving him down here for the last couple months and I, God, I hope it ends soon. <laughs> but but uh, he gets in the car with his boat and then his sails are in a bag. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do that. I, I have to be, when I get out of the truck here, I want to throw the boat in the water and be 95% sure that the balance is going to be right as per that condition. So I think a lot, I asked, uh, hopefully a lot of people brought rake sticks. So the, the basic average rake is 1135. And we're going we're gonna to go through these things really quick. That's the, that's the rake that all the tuning guides have. So that's where I started. And just so everybody know, we're doing it the same thing. I've kind of changed. I actually set my backstay before I do the rake now. I used to do it with a light, with no backstay. So essentially it's the back edge of that black bumper to the center of the hole up top. It's, and mine is spot on 1135. So that's, that's, that's the basic rake that everybody goes off of. And the reason, the reason why that is, is because it all has to do with the setup of the mast at the deck too. If you go further back than that, you're gonna start uh, lower bending the mast a little bit too much and, and probably inverting your uh, mainsail a little too quick. And if you go further forward than that, that, that setup at the, at the base of the mast at the deck level is, is going to make it off too. So uh, combined with the rake at 1135, the mast at the deck level is all the way aft. 100% of the time, I actually press on it because you're, try you're trying to get the mast, at the end of the day, you're trying to get the mast uh, bend set up for the mainsail, for the mainsail luff curve. So those two, those two things have to be right. So I've changed. Uh, I've changed my philosophy this past year. I read a really good article by, I believe, the current world champion. And he actually uh, is convinced that keeping the backstay pretty close to the same all the time and adjusting your forestay is a little more efficient. So I decided, what the heck, I'm, I'm open-minded, as my wife will tell you, I'm super open-minded. So I started doing that this year and I've kind of turned into a bit of a hybrid of, of that concept. So let me explain. 1135 is what I consider my aft rake setting, right? Center of the hole to the aft edge of the bumper. And those of you, if you guys, while we're doing this, if you guys want to measure your boats and, and, and don't worry about the disruptions, but the, the whole point here is for us to leave here with your boat that much more uh, effectively tuned. So, so if you have rake sticks or, or after I'm done here, you can borrow mine, um, please go ahead and, and feel free to do some work while we're, while we're talking about it. Um, so that's my aft rake measurement. I go about three mil further forward than that. I have a second mark up on the head stay that if it gets a little windier or I think it's gonna be kind of medium to top end of, this is the A-rig of course, of the A-rig. Um, I'll actually go forward on the head stay now. And that, what that does, it does a, a few things. It, it straightens out the mass down low when it straightened out the mass down low, it lets you, put, uh, lets you put a little more boom bang on without inverting the mainsail. Head stay gets tighter. Everything, you know, a lot of really good things happen with it. So instead of just keeping the same rake measurement or that force stay uh, measurement and just adjusting the back stay all the time, I'm actually going 1135 to about 1132 um, I'm on the two different settings. Just two settings, keep it simple. It's, it's incredible how we can all 
you know, a couple weeks ago, Tommy was going fast here, and I wouldn't have set, if, if I set my boat up the way you had it set up, I would, have, I would have blown my head off. I couldn't believe it, and you were plenty fast that day. So, so there's a million ways to skin the cat here. Um, so anyway, two rakes, one backstay, tension, and I can't help myself, but if it's a little, if it's a little lighter or uh, a little heavier, I'll actually adjust the backstay. Only, remember, it's only two or three mil, right? Two or three mil on a boat this size is like a foot and a half on a 100 footer. So, so you gotta realize that these, these tweaks, these little measurements we take one way or the other are, it, it's incredibly small, which makes an incredibly big difference. So, um, and once we get through the rake and the mast step, Again, mast up all the way aft all the time, never touch it. Um, let's go right down through the center of the boat. First of all, the bridle. I have my bridle loose, so it's almost, the ring is almost, it, it, you probably can't see this, but the ring is up almost to, uh, to boom level. It's like what we used to do on our 420s when we were kids. You know, you, you vang, you're vang sheeting, so when you're vang sheeting, the last thing you want is that ring to be way down low. You want it right to be up in parallel with the boom going back and forth. You gotta make sure that ring is in the center of the boat, uh, which is obviously critical. And this is one of the few things that I glue. I glue the bridal bowsies because it seemed like every time I got in a collision, one of those, uh, one of those bridles was off. And before you know it, I'm sailing a whole race with the mainsail way out on one side and way in on the other side. So I actually glue it. But, but getting that bridle up in the air as high as you can is, is really important. Um, one trick is where you put the main sheet and jib sheet uh, positions on the booms. This, the jib sheet, if you can see, is well forward of the ringlet that it actually goes through. And the reason for that is it allows the jib to go out further downwind. So it's not, it's not straight over the top of that ringlet. It's actually well forward. It's about, let's call it, a finger and a half forward of the ringlet. You want it to go further out downwind. And by the way, it's out compared to the boom. So I have the boom that goes out not quite to 90 degrees, and I'm trying to get the jib out to 90 degrees. I actually want the jib to be further forward than the mainsail goes out. Um, it actually helps set up flow coming from the leech to the luff going downwind when you're wing and wing. So, that ba so anyway, that position on the boom of where the, uh, of where the jib sheet goes, just slide it forward. A lot of people, are you allowed to glue it in place? You are? Yes. Uh, I think a lot of people glue it. I, I know you're not allowed to put a piece of tape for some reason, but you're allowed to glue it. Rubber retainers that come with the boat. Okay. And then, uh, and remember, you can adjust, and Jeff will probably explain this in a while, you can adjust your in out. So, you know, on a windy day, you could actually just adjust on your transmitter. Uh, having, having this, you know, only go out that far, or you can go out that far, or you can make it go out further on a course of a day. So, so those, the placement of those uh, fittings on the, uh, on the booms are very important. The boom fitting is essentially dead, dead nuts over top of the bridle ring. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any reason to really alter that position. Jib sheet. This is something I learned from reading that tuning guide from the world champion is <clears throat> I've changed putting the jib sheet uh, from, the, from the boom through both of the eyes rather than just one eye, because it actually does. If it's just through one eye, the jib is a little bit different um, from tack to tack. When you go through both eyes and you line them both up, um, the jib actually is the same trim from tack to tack. I, I never would have thought of that one, so somebody else thinks about this even more than I do, so I, I was very happy to read that one. Um, main halyard setup. This is a big one that I think a lot of people struggle with. You know, the boat, the boat struggles with it. it the, the beauty of this boat is its simplicity. The, the drawback of this boat is its simplicity, right? So you have, you have the option of two holes that you can use in the back, in, the top, in your uh, mast crane. Uh, for, this is for the main halyard. Now, you can only use one hole, so you can't split it and, 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 have, and have tension going fore and aft to two holes. You're, I think, and by the way, Jim, if I'm, if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense to the rules, please call me on it, but I, I believe I've read, I've read that in the past. So 
so I've, I actually have three holes up here of which one I have filled in because I was trying different locations and we all have seen it. When you turn to go downwind especially, the, the top of your mainsail is all screwed up, right? And that's all because of the positioning of, of this string. So first of all, I used to have it two to one and I now just have it one to one so it can swivel that much easier. Two to one kind of held the, the, the uh, large roach of the mainsail from going all out very far. So it's one to one and it's right to the bottom of the silver band. If you try to go any tighter up, if you try to pull your main halyard up any further than the bottom of the metal band, um, it just, it, it won't allow the top of the sail to pivot very well. It doesn't pivot very well to begin with, so you're trying your hardest to get it to pivot um, by, by keeping that distance as long as possible. And you know you've gone too long when your Cunningham's bottomed out. So, so I, I keep it as long as I can up here with just a, still a tiny, tiny bit of Cunningham uh, movement at the bottom of the mass so you can, you can at least put a little bit of tension enough to take the scallops out of the front of the mainsail if, if need be. So the second thing is I, I think th these are the, a lot of us, we did a fleet order of, to the uh, black cat sails. I personally think there's a little too much luff curve in the top of these sails. Um, so I actually let uh, my little string at the top that holds the, the uh, head of the mainsail to the mast, I actually have eased that off quite a bit. What that does is kind of take some of that luff curve problem out up, up in this area. And I actually read, I thought it was really interesting, I've, I've read that, uh, again, that, that world champion talking about it, um, he had a special set of sails made with two mil taken out of the top of, of the mainsail. I, I think if I did it again, I, I would probably ask for that. Uh, if you take two mil out here, you add two mil to the leech, you're still using the sail area, but I think it sets up to the mast bend a little bit. So this is pretty far off, this fore and aft. The rest of them are pretty even for the most part, probably a little tighter on the, on the top one uh, compared to the bottom ones, all these little hoops that go around the mast. I don't know what they call them. Um, because again, I'm trying to get rid of luff curve here, so I have this one fairly tight. And especially the one down in the bottom where the vang really affects the bottom bend of the mast, I probably have that the loosest of the group as you went up and down. But it's something that you can kind of play with from week to week. They're easy to, they're easy to reset. I don't use the metal pieces because I think they're too constrictive and I, I, I think a little bit of diff, uh, different distance um, from the sail to the mast is, is important. So that's the reason why I don't use those uh, metal pieces anywhere. Plus, I look at metal and I just see weight and I'm sure it doesn't make any difference, but it does to me. I can't sleep at night. <laughs> you, can't, you can't judge your sail trim unless uh, either A, you're in a building like this and there's not a breath of air, or if you have to make a change out on the water, you have to try to do it downwind and behind yourself because the side mass forces when a boat is stationary and the wind is just hitting the boat statically are way more than when it's out sailing. When it's out sailing, it's actually releasing a lot of that load, um, especially side force load on the mast. So you're trying, when you're looking at it and you're trying to figure out twist, you have to somehow try to protect this thing behind you if you have to do it out on the dock or in between races or something like that. Because if you try to do it just to the wind, you're never gonna, it's gonna look way over twisted. It, it looks all screwed up. So, th so that's really important. And it's another reason why I tune the boat up before I leave my house, because it's just like here. You can, oh, that's good, oh, wait, hang, hang on. I, about, I got about a half a mil, I'm gonna ease here. The only way you can judge it is in a static, uh, no wind situation like this, which is, which is super, super important. Um, Let's see, so I, I wasn't a believer in this until recently, but so once I switched to the method of two, two settings on the head stay, and in essence, one setting on the back stay, I wanted to learn where my max bend was. So I stuck it on the floor, and, I, and you could actually sight it, and you can play with your, main, so with your back stay here just with your finger, figure out that the mass bends a little more up top, a little more down low. It gives you a pretty good view, and you can also see when it starts to invert. So the whole goal here, you know, these boats for the most part, as we all know, are pretty overpowered little boats, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna set my, my back stay too tight right now, 
and hopefully we can see, we've all seen the wrinkle, right? That's the, the inversion wrinkle that goes to the back, uh, back of the mast, usually kind of in this area. This is where the mast overbends first. We've all put our boat in the water. We've all gone sailing with it. We've all seen it a million times on other people's boats. I wonder when they're gonna take the inversion out of their mainsail. Well, that's, that's because there's too much mass bend, it, but it's good to know when there is too much mass bend, it's pretty good to know. What does it look like? Well, fortunately, this is not a big boat and you can actually look at it in your garage or in your basement or here at Sail Newport and figure out, wow, it is really, it's bending like crazy down low. It's just something to kind of calibrate in your own brain um, to, to, as to where you want where you're going to make these marks. So I put a black mark, only a single black mark, on my backstay where I think absolute ma max mass bend just starting to invert the mainsail position may be. Just one single mark now. So I have two marks up here and I have one mark back here. Again, like I said, uh, I, I'm probably give or take two or three mil in the back, just kind of adjusting it for the day. Might be a choppy day where I got a little less bang, so I'm gonna let a little, little bit of backstay off, something like that. But anyway, I think it's really simplified. It also allows, if you're gonna, breeze is picking up, and I hate to do this in the course of a day, because once you find out the balance of the boat, and, and whether you have weather or lee helm or not, you hate to make a big change on the dock. You know, it's, if you're making big changes on the dock because your boat has radical lee helm or radical windward helm, you're probably kind of, excuse my French, you're kind of effed, you know, because unless you have really good marks. So I've worked hard at having a really good rake setting mark. Again, those two rake settings, the light and the heavy, and one really good backstay mark. So if I do have to change in the, in the given day or kind of get a little lost or the boat gets in a collision, or whatever the case may be, I can get right back to where that position is. And so with the two here and the one here, there's really only one other variable that really comes into play, and that's the topping lift. The topping lift is that if you change the rake, you have to change the topping lift. If you change the topping lift, you're, you're just on its own, you're fine tuning the twist. But when you make even a two or three mil change to the, to the head stay, Technically, you don't have to change the backstay if you've gotten it, if you have it right. So if I'm going from a light air setting to a heavy air setting, I'm increasing the, I'm shortening the headstay tension by about three mil. Technically, I'm set up, I'm pretty comfortable in mass bend to luff curve to backstay. I'm set up so I don't have to do anything other than just change the topping lift. So I have two positions, two marks on my topping lift, two marks on my headstay, one mark on my backstay, and if I'm feeling really out of balance or the breeze is really picked up or dropped in the course of a day, I'm pretty sure I can make a wholesale change in the one and a half minutes between races, throw it back in the water and be pretty darn close to being sorted for the next race. So once I got to that point of simplification, I, I tell you that it, it was kind of a game changer because how many times you put it off the dock, you bring it back in quick, put it off the dock, and before you know it, you hear the damn speaker saying 28 seconds to the start and, and, and you're tossing your boat in at the last second. I, I'm, I'm quite sure now I can, set, I can set this thing up in 30 seconds for a complete wholesale change. So I would, I would highly recommend uh, <clears throat> kind of learning and understanding those principles of rig setup um, and, and just and, and making one mark uh, per each, or two marks for the head stay, two marks for the uh, topping lift, and one mark for the back stay. Again, you can fine tune, you can go a little bit on either side of it once you really start to understand the, the principles behind it, but those will get you pretty darn uh, close to the, uh, in the ballpark. The head stay sag, I think for the most part, you could say you just never want it. You, if you see your head stay pumping at all, then something's wrong, something's out of whack. You got too much, you got too much rake, you got not enough backstay, um, your mass step may not be in the right place, something's wrong. So if you see your head stay pumping around, that's a telltale side, sign that something may be out of whack. Um, jib tack down, on the, down in the Cunningham area, and again, I'm just rifling through all these things, we can talk about it later. I, I've seen some people raise the, 
uh, what do you call this? Jib tac. Jib tac? Okay, there we go. So uh, thanks, Jim. Um, Jib tac position, I, it's a little up in the air right now because it's been on tight for the night, but uh, I, I get that as close to the deck as I can. The only drawback of that is the sail doesn't wing and wing quite as easily, I, I feel, as if it's up in the air slightly. But I, I'm an end plate guy, so I, I'm trying to get the sails down as close to the hull as possible because I think the uh, acceleration of breeze under the sail is far more than you could ever possibly realize. And uh, I'm trying to get the sails as close to the deck as possible. Jib Cunningham all the way, all the way uh, forward. I don't believe I've ever used it. I don't think I've ever pulled it on. And the reason being is, remember, these sails are bored flat, right? There, there's, there, there are rules created to make sure they're flat. There's no broad seams. You're not allowed to have any luff curve in the jib. The only shaping to the sail whatsoever is, is what the wind does is stretch and also broad seam, uh, sorry, uh, luff curve in the mainsail as it sets up to the mast. So, so, I think if you over tension, I, I almost always have wrinkles off the luff of the jib because I, I think you're just, any shape that you're trying to get into the sail, you're helping eliminate it <clears throat> with the jib Cunningham if you're not careful. So I, I've retuned some of your boats and I've, I've flicked that piece of string right there and it's bone tight. That's probably 60% of your problem. So you need shape. Somehow you need to get shape. The only time I'd ever snug it up is if you're right at the top end of an A-rig, you might actually possibly use it, but that's something I would strongly recommend that uh, you just be careful because you're taking away shape from something that doesn't have any shape. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's certainly a struggle. All right, I'm gonna shut this off for a sec. All right, <clears throat> so deck measurements. And I, some of you people, I, I started this with Brad because when Brad first, Brad, my brother actually, set up my, my very first boat. Um, and he put uh, three marks on the deck for sheet, for sheet locations. And you, you might think of it as light, medium, and heavy. But I think of it as balance, as, as, uh, as windward, Lee Helm, uh, Weatherhelm, Lee Helm, uh, balance marks. So like, like all sailors who sail modern boats, I, be, I was convinced from day one that I can pull a jib in tighter than anybody else because that's what you do again on your TP-52 or your Cape 31 or any other boat. Well, it, it's unfortunately not the case. And I have been easing and easing and easing my jib out over the years to be out pretty close to where all the experts said I, you should have been in the first place. So funny enough, the people who know how to sail these boats were probably right. Um, I, I, I have these three locations, and I, I, don't ha I, didn't, I didn't actually measure them, but I have a, a, a ruler up here. The, the only reason you need to measure mine is if we want to talk about it before or during a race. Jeff, Jeff did this a while ago on his boat, and halfway through racing in the course of a day, he might be going fast or I'm going fast, and one, one of us can say to the other, hey, uh, what are you on? I'm, I'm on red. I'm red jib, and I'm a green main here today, or I'm halfway between red and green. That's the only reason you should measure mine. Where those are is essentially irrelevant. It's that you know where they are and you start setting consistently up to those marks. So again, if I'm, as you know, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody <clears throat> about where my settings are on any time during a race or in between races or anything else. That's the only reason that if you're interested, come measure mine and we can talk about it before, during, or after racing. Um, Essentially, what Brad did was put three marks and then took a ruler and drew a line from the uh, tack fitting that the jib is set up at um, back through that mark. And that's, that's where the, that's the, the, the cadence of the marks on the deck in both positions, drew, put, put three dots on the deck, drew a line straight to the gooseneck here, and, and those are the three positions there. All the way inside is black, middle is red, outside is green. I, I, I just like having, I, I, this is really the only place on the boat I think you need marks because it's different from week to week and, um, and it's a really easy way to be able to fine tune your sheets, again, to work on Lee Helm versus Weather Helm. So, Again, uh, I got a ruler up here if you want. I actually have, th I have three colored markers too if you want to put them on your boat. Um, 
it's totally up to you. I would just recommend having something because I think it's really important from a consistency week to week, day to day, even race to race standpoint, that, uh, that you know where you're at. And, and again, once you learn it, once you learn the concept of I have a little bit of Lee Helm here, um, we'll talk about the, what you, what the variables of if you have Lee Helm or if you have Weather Helm, but the sheeting, whether it's sheet in or sheet out, that's, somebody asked me last week, what's the first thing you go to if you have too much Weather Helm or too much Lee Helm? Well, the sheet's easiest. That, that's, what do you do on a regular boat? You ease the main or you ease the jib, or you tighten the main or you tighten the jib. The helmsman says, I'm all loaded up, ease the mains a little bit. So, so I think that's the number one course tune way to actually get rid of Lee Helm or, or get rid of Weather Helm. Um, but as we'll talk about in a second, there's about, unfortunately, there's about 10,000 other variables at the same time. Jib is because it's not just taking the jib leech clue off center line, but you're rotating, you're rotating the luff of the sail towards the wind. So very quickly, you're taking away pointing ability. So it's one of the reasons why I really freaked out about sailing with the jib too far out, because the luff, the luff is turning around this pivot point, whereas on a normal boat, the pivot point stays the same in the front of the boat, and it's just the clue that's moving. Well, here, you're, it's a double-edged sword. You're not only losing back end, but you're losing front end to the wind at the same time. Um, turns out, all those experts were right. Um, so so, so I, I've been sailing with it looser and looser. Um, uh, we'll talk about Jeff's stuff in a minute as to whether you actually think about putting two settings on your on your uh, transmitter in order to have like a point mode and a, and a sail fast mode. I, I kind of pulled my, I kind of probably set my sheets up a little bit slightly tighter than right for the given day. And I just use my finger on the transmitter quite a bit. I'm in and out and in and out all the time going upwind. Um, others have, I, I think we'll talk about, others have switches where you can, you flick a switch in one condition for, for a real tight setting or loose setting. Others use the, uh, use the, the little pieces, the, the little gauges, uh, the micro uh, tuning gauges compared to uh, the macros up here. So anyway, um, <clears throat> that's sheeting. Uh, that's your macro. That, that's, your, that's your macro tuning uh, ability. And I guess, Mike, to answer your question, I, I'd say the boom is slightly in from the gunnel and the jib is darn, darn close to it. But again, I, I'm going to leave this up here. You guys can measure. You can tweak and, and have, have a look all, all you want when it's done. The other one is outhaul. Um, I used to be fanatical about all outhaul. And um, again, it might have been sound against Tommy one day. Um, he, he had, I, you could have put four fingers in there. He, the, his sails were so deep, I didn't think, it, it was like you sailing around with a blooper. And all you young kids have no idea what a blooper is, but us old people know what a blooper is. So. Uh, so I stopped being so anal about it, to be honest. So I just use my fingers. I, I'm, a, I'm a, between a two finger and a one finger guy, and on any given day, I'm a finger and a half guy. Finger and a half here, and a finger and a half here. I almost, it, if I adjust one, I adjust the other. You, you set the boat and you go upwind, and everything looks pretty good when it's going upwind. It's hard, it's hard to really judge from, because it's hard to get right directly behind your boat, right? Your boat rarely is sailing away from you. So <clears throat> he said a lot of the good sailors in the class turn downwind and judge their twist when the boat's going downwind. So you can really see it. If your mainsail's way twisty and open downwind as it sails by the dock in front of you, probably bring it in right away. Just put a little bit of vang on and start, and start pulling. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> excuse me, on the other hand, if you're going downwind and there's no give to your, to your main sheet at all and it's just bone tight, not only is that super, if there's any way to go slow downwind, that's the way to go slow. But uh, it's just the telltale sign that you don't have enough twist. So it's really, it was kind of a fun tr uh, trick to, uh, to judge. Another, another trick that somebody, I think in Florida, told me at this one of these regattas, is how to tape your hatch. Another way to keep water out. This is, this is <laughs> I can't take credit for a lot of these things because I think this is, pure insanity that somebody ever thought it through this much. But they start at the back. They put the cross piece of tape on the back first, 
and then work your way forward. And the final one is on the front because you're kind of creating a ramp for the, for the water to go up and over versus a scoop. And it'll find any little crevice, the, the old water will. So you tape the back first, tape the side second, and tape the front third. And I, when I started doing that, it probably wasn't coincidental that I, I haven't had any water since then either. <clears throat> fun, fun little fact. Again, I didn't think of that. I think that's insane that somebody actually did. Um, okay. Couple more. So, so I, t I, I told you guys that, that I, I really, I'm a, there's no question that you can roll jive these boats if you do it effectively. You just don't have to hold it and s try to spin your sails over. It's a, it's a little bit of a turn. Sails pop through. You trim them as they're popping through, acceleration, and, and back down again. So I think there is something to be said for boat handling, for, for better boat handling than others. So jibing is certainly one of them. Um, using the jib tack weight, I have it pushed in all the way right now. A lot of people, and I was one of them for a long time, for trying to get the jib to wing and wing, I had the, the jib weight out quite far. I find that the chances of hooking up on somebody in a crash is, is accentuated times 50 if those, if those weights are sticking way out. So I've just decided to try to get better at flicking into a wing and wing rather than having that jib uh, weight hang way out there. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's personal preference. Um, I've seen a lot of people with them way out, others with them way in, uh, personal preference, but that's, wh that's what it's there for. Um, overpowered downwind, is there a trick? People ask all the time. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a trick. I've asked a million people. Some people say, don't go wing and wing. Other people say, go by the lee and try to eliminate. I, I don't know. If anybody has any tricks, I'm all ears because I haven't, on these boats, I haven't figured it out. In the IOMs, it was, for me, in the IOMs, it was stay dead downwind and use the really full bow to just try, try to keep the rudder in the water and keep the thing tracking. These things just go bow down pretty quick. I, I don't know, anybody have any tricks to not wipe out downwind and big breeze? I, I've actually tried to slow my tacks down and, and gotten in trouble because of it, but there's no question that, that, uh, uh, that being at max speed before any tack is super important. You can't be feathered and then roll into a tack. You're risking being in irons. And the second part of it is uh, tacking, uh, tacking and breeze, you have to lay the bow down and you have, to, you have to let your sheets out coming out of a tack. If you don't, the chances of, of head to wind um, and being in irons are enhanced greatly. So, so it's really kind of like roll jiving. It's, it's a little bit of coordination with your hands, but coming out of attack, you're just automatically easing the, the sheets out, laying on it, accelerating, and coming back up in a way like you would do in any big boat at, at the same time. The, the risk here is, of course, irons. The risk in a big boat is just a slow tack. Um, let's see. And then, well, and then we'll talk, when Jeff does his uh, quick thing, we're going to talk about <clears throat> having a high, a high mode or a fast mode, um, I, I, like I said before, I tend to just work the, work the, the throttle a little bit from, from it, all the way in to all the way out. But I think Jeff's going to show us some tricks on how to use all the other 42 buttons here that, that I've never actually used before. So first things to know about this uh, radio is we use uh, channel one to steer and channel three for our sheets, right? We don't really use any of these other buttons most of the time. We have, when this goes up and down, this little button here is a, is a, a fine tune on what's going on here. So if you have a little bit of rudder imbalance, you can do the same thing here. You can adjust it while you're sailing. Or if you don't like your sheet position slightly, you can adjust it here. Keep in mind that using these buttons is just like moving your joystick. So if you have a rudder imbalance, you can compensate it while you're sailing, but try to fix that mechanically as soon as you can because you're giving up some of your throw in the other direction because you've compensated for it and you've only got so much range. Okay. Um, other thing about these things, they will f die if they get wet. So buy a cover or have a lot of plastic bags. 
tape up this hole in the back where the, the data cable would go. You're probably never going to use the data cable, but if you ever want to, you're going to be glad that you taped that up because it'll work. And tape your battery cover shut because they always fall off and people have to buy new ones. Okay? So basic settings on this. There's a couple menu items. You have to push the uh, OK button to make the screen come on and then you push and hold it. And you get to here and there's two menus. There's system and setup. System menu controls the radio, okay? And the setup are, is for your particular model and how you want the radio to control that model. I'm gonna do setup first because it's the one that we care about the most. So I hit the up button. You see setup is highlighted and I hold it down or right, push it, all right? So we're gonna start with reverse and you, 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 okay, let me, we're going to hit the up menu to get to setup. We're going to hit OK, and this brings us to the setup menu. You use the up and down arrow to pick the thing you want to change. Everybody probably, if they haven't done it themselves, someone did it for them. Everybody needs to know how to use reverse. What reverse does is it changes the direction of the servo relative to the joystick. Channel one, if it's not reversed, your boat's gonna steer like you're holding a tiller. And most people don't like that. So you switch, you reverse that. I have channel three reversed because I have the newer gray orange winch. You have to reverse it for that winch. If you have the old blue winch, you leave that the way it normally is. One of the weirdest things about these radios when you want to, uh, first to switch to which channel you're controlling, you, toggle, you, you cycle through them with the OK button. One of the weirdest things about these radios, you change the value with the up and down button, and you, you say OK. Well, that didn't save anything. I think it's something that got lost in translation. To make that, see, if I go out of here, or if I turn my radio off and back on, See, that setting didn't last. To make a setting last, you have to hold the cancel button till it makes that beep. So it's very counterintuitive that cancel means save. All right now, if I go back in, that channel two got reversed. It doesn't matter, we don't use channel two, okay? So everybody should know that basic function. Endpoints is the next basic control. The endpoints, control how far the servo will go for any given extreme joystick position. So if you push your joystick all the way over there, it'll go to whatever that endpoint is, the, the servo setting. Um, to change which one you want to set, this is not very obvious, you have to, channel one left, I push it left. If I want to change the channel one right, I push it right. Now, if you're looking at this, you're probably saying, why would he have 120, 103? Well, the reality is these joysticks aren't that great. And my particular radio, which is like three years old, the far left doesn't work very well. So I bumped that up to 120% because the reality is when I go that far, that's about all I'm going to get. All right, so, and I'll show you how to figure that out in a few minutes. And then on channel three, I do have the newer winch. You'll notice I have a lot less throw here on channel three. With the blue winch, I was close to a minus 100, 100. I found with, to get the same amount of throw on the main boom, these numbers worked with the modern winch. Okay? So you'll want to play with your endpoints. You can also play with these day to day. If you set your boat up and say your sheets are a little too tight or a little too loose, you can change the endpoints on channel three and fix that without having to adjust the boat, okay? So we're gonna get out of here, that's endpoints. Now I mentioned, I'll show you how to um, figure out what's not working right. The, I use the display all the time. Um, well, the display will show you what your radio is sending to the boat. So when I go full right joystick, it's putting full left rudder on, right? And when I go full that way, it's putting full right rudder on. And you can see that I have about the same amount 
of output for the two things, even though my endpoints were set really weird, and it's because my joystick's no good and I want to buy a new radio. Okay? Um, you can do this for every channel, like channel three. You can see where your sheets go, right? And then we don't use these other channels, but you could see I could play with channel six or channel five. Well, it doesn't, worry, it doesn't matter. We're not going to use those, okay? So use the display when you're setting your radio up to see the effect of what you've done. You don't need to look at your boat. You don't need to go sail your boat. Just look at this display. All right, we don't really have any use <coughs> for the auxiliary channels. <coughs> the sub trim, you could use the sub trim is basically like a bigger version of these little side buttons. And if you had some <coughs> big imbalance in your rudder, you might use the sub trim. But honestly, I don't know anybody who does use sub trim. The next one is a really important one. This dual rate um, thing makes the output of your radio relative to the joystick nonlinear. Okay? And you can do that on these radios on channels one, two, and four. And we use channel one for our rudder. So this is the one you're going to want to do. The first thing you're going to want to do is get down to the exponent. And when you get your boat new, that exponent is going to be zero. And it's going to be a straight line like that. So that means if you move this a tiny 1%, the rudder is going to move 1%. And the reality is for these little boats with these giant rudders, that's a, that's a way overkill. Right? So you decrease, or you increase the exponent to make that thing look. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. I was right the first time. You decrease it to make that thing as least sensitive in the center bottle. That one doesn't self-center, so it works slightly different. So there's a different setting for that. And this one, you have four data points that you can cust create a custom curve. And you'll see. Which channel are you on? I'm on. All right, let me. Curve. You gotta go down, down page first. Yeah, so. When you first go into um, the setup menu, it looks like the dual rate is the last thing. But if you keep going down, there's a lot more settings underneath that. So we're going to get the throttle curve. And this one you set individually, like my, my lowest setting, if I wanted to change that to something less than 0%, I just go up or down, right? And you have, uh, I guess, five positions you can set. And you can create the curve by putting in the percentage of the sheet you want for each one of those settings. So you can see my curve is radical. What this does is, let me go to the display. You can see that I move my joystick to the middle, and my sheet didn't go out very far, right? It, it didn't, I mean, it didn't go all the way out. It's still in the bottom half. It's like I'm still going upwind, even though the joystick's in the middle. When I'm way down here, I can make very minor adjustments to my main sheet. And I use that if I want to get into a foot mode or if I'm already in foot mode and I want to get to point mode, you can make very small adjustments. If you don't play with that throttle curve, it's going to be very, very hard to make small adjustments. Um, I mentioned that. Where do you have it set at? Here are my settings. I, I know only one person that has their first position even lower than 5%. I think most people would find that very desensitive. Um, I like it that way, okay? No matter of taste, this one you're going to want to, you can use the display, but this one you're going to want to put your boat in the water and go play with it when you set it to see what you find where you really like, okay? This is mine. If anybody wants to look at these numbers, I go 5, 10, 30, 100. And what that happens is at the top end, from like here to here, 
my main goes from like 30 degrees out to 100% out, so it just dumps it. And that's fine for upwind and pre-start. Um, <coughs> Uh, 10, 20, 60, 100 is mine. So your L is at 10? No, uh, no L, sorry, 0, 10, 20, 60, 100. So there's, the next one down is mix. No use for us. If you're a helicopter pilot, you might like that. Uh, L, we don't use this setting. The V-tail we don't use. Switches assign is if you want to do anything a little fancier with your radio, you might want to use one of these four switches to control a setting. Um, you can see I actually broke one of mine, but I, you only need two. Um, when you go into here, for fly mode, because this is for a plane, fly mode refers to your rudder control. And I assign switch D, they go A, B, C, D. I assign switch D to the fly mode, and you'll see if I, if I flip it, it changes to sport. When we go back to that other display where that exponent auxiliary rate thing is set, if you flip this switch, Sorry, you... Where, where is this? Okay. Under what? Let me go back out. All right. Let me... Uh, it's, it's way down below throttle curve. Switch is assigned. Oh, switch is assigned. Sorry. Okay. okay. Yep. You go in there, and the fly, the first fly mode, again, refers to what we use for our rudder. And... You can have two curves, one for normal and one for sport. I actually have a sport mode, which is um, even less, it's even deader. I changed, I think, that endpoint from minus 85. And this is actually an answer for you, Ken, why I have that thing not, not zero. Because I have two curves, and my other curve only goes to like 60. Because when it's really, really nuky, I use sport mode downwind so that I don't accidentally give the boat too much rudder and it wipes out. What does sport mode mean? It's just an alternative to what channel one does. But is it quicker, is it slower? Or is it's it whatever you want it to be. So when you go, let me go back to this, right? Let me, let me show you guys something. So if we go up here to my throttle curve, right? But don't do it. If we go up to my throttle curve, I have switch D tied to sport mode, right? When I switch that, oh, I'm in the wrong, sorry. Channel one, it's auxiliary. Watch, when I switch this, the curve changes. Right? So you can have different rudder modes for different conditions. So the other thing in the switches assign, you'll see that idle mode I have to switch A, which is this one on here. Idle mode, remember our our sheet is controlled by a throttle. So idle mode gives you a secondary throttle curve, right? So you can see here it goes from normal to idle up. And I guess with airplanes, they have an idle up mode until the motor gets warm, right? So if we go back to uh, throttle curve. You can see this is my upwind thro my default upwind throttle curve. I set, I used my second setting for a downwind mode. You see the curve is exactly opposite. And I find this useful downwind on light days or on offset legs where you're trying to do a lot of reaching and you, you're trying to get that sail set right between like the 45 and 90 degree setting. Uh, with my extreme upwind settings, I could never do that. So I use this in reaching conditions. Kenny mentioned that you could use this to switch from pinch to foot mode. If you wanted to do that, what you would do is you would have two curves that both look like upwind curves, but you'd change L. Say you wanted a foot mode, right? You'd change L to be not so far. Oh, I changed one by accident. But when you go into the system menu, Model select, these radios can have up to 20 sets of settings. So if you, you could have multiple settings for your boat or you could have multiple boats. If, if you want to talk to me later about that, we'll talk about it. There's really no, don't need to go into that, any of this stuff. But we want to go into RX setup. RX setup has this thing called fail safe. And this controls what your receiver in the boat is going to 
do if it loses connection to your transmitter. So this is important because we try to set our boats up to be perfectly balanced. Like Ken said, he puts his boat in the water and it just sails away. Well, if he wasn't paying attention, somebody started yakking with him, his boat would sail all the way across the harbor or up onto the rocks. So if you lose connection with the boat, it's going to do that as well. So what you do with your fail safe is you set something in channel one and channel three. And for me, I have my rudder 72% to one side and the sheet minus 62%. So you'll watch my boat, right? So it's, in, it's trimmed in really nice and tight. The rudder's on center. If I turn my radio off, ease the sails and the rudder kicked out. That way, if you lose a connection to your boat, it's just gonna sit there and make circles till someone goes, gets it, or you reestablish your radio connection. So I highly recommend that everybody set the fail safe on their radio. All right, we'll do it one more time. Okay, you go into the menus, and you go into system, and then you scroll down to RX setup, and then in RX setup you go to fail safe, and then you set for channel one and channel three, whatever you want, but something other than zero. Because if you lose connection to the boat, you don't want it to sail away. How do you adjust? You'd use the up and down buttons. Oh no, you used OK and then the up and down buttons. Or, oh I take that back Tommy, it's been a while since I do this. You actually put the joystick where you want and then hold the cancel button. Of course. Because yeah. <laughs> cancel means save. Um, Jeff, can you uh, just talk about the marks that you have on your deck for your... Um... Okay, yeah. So in addition to the uh, sail trim marks that Brad developed, the one really important mark, and this has to have a reference mark on your deck for your sheet position, because inevitably at some point you're going to break an elastic and your, your sheet's going to unspool, right? Or you're going to change your winch and you're going to have to replace it or you're gonna re-rig your boat and your sheets aren't gonna be the same. So, in a perfect world, my clip would go right to my line, right? But the reality is when I set up my new winch, I didn't get it just right. I didn't wanna mess with my sheets. So, but I know that my default position now is about a centimeter in front of my line. You need something to know where your baseline is. Because when you change, the other thing is if you have multiple rigs, make sure that you use your baseline of one rig to set your sheets on your other rig. So if you have to go from A to B, you don't have to mess with you know, your radio or anything else because the sheets are different. Make sure all your rigs are trimmed the same. 